Hi, everyone. Welcome to Talk the Wellness Tea with Dr. Chalice. Listen, I am so excited about tonight's discussion. We have an awesome panel of fellow Pink Sister survivors. I can't wait to introduce everyone. I'm going to briefly share my story. So I'm Dr. Chalice Rhodes. I'm a licensed professional counselor, board certified telemental health counselor, national certified counselor, cancer oncology behavioral health specialist, and I am a DCIS breast cancer survivor. So last September, I had a lumpectomy to remove the breast cancer. And then in December 21st, of last year, I finished 22 radiation treatments. And now I'm turning my pain into purpose and we are bringing breast cancer and mental health to the forefront. I also offer uh, six week online uh, telehealth groups for people that live in Georgia, Florida, Delaware, New Jersey. I offer individual therapy. And in my app, Dr. Chalice Teach, I created a course called Thrive Breast Cancer Survivorship. So I used to be a professor in higher education for 12 years. Now I'm continuing to use my teaching gifts by creating creative courses. So let's get to our introduction of panelists. First, we are going to start with Aaron Campion Kane. Aaron is so dear to my heart because Aaron was actually the patient navigator in the room with me when I had to have a biopsy for the radiologist to see if it was actually cancer right? Because it looks suspicious on a mammogram. And, you know, back in 2017, they thought it was just a cyst on my right breast, but that biopsy revealed that it was actually breast cancer. And I'm so thankful for my life because God caught that early. He used the mammogram and then he used Aaron in the room with me to calm my fears because I was so scared and Aaron was there to comfort me. But even more deeply, it's very interesting how how God connects things over time. Because like 15 years ago, I actually hired Aaron. I hired Aaron. I was supervising a partial hospitalization program for adults with mental health and substance abuse challenges. And Aaron came in and she had graduated from Drexel's Behavioral Health Counseling Program. And I had never seen anything like this program. Like the courses that she did at the bachelor's level were actually courses that I did at the master's level. So it was so interesting, her resume. And then the other interesting piece, Aaron, is that you know, maybe, you know, later down the line, I ended up teaching at Drexel as an assistant clinical professor of counseling and family therapy in that behavioral health counseling program. So I just don't think, I don't believe in coincidences. And I just thought that this was so interesting that when I walked into the biopsy room, I see these big, beautiful blue eyes and she had on her mask, but nobody could forget Aaron's eyes. So when I walked into the room, I was like, Aaron, and she was like, Dr. Chalice. And I was like, oh my God, Aaron, I'm so scared. I'm so scared. And she was like, don't worry. She's like, I'm here to help you. She walked me. She talked me through everything. I felt so comforted. She let me act like a big old baby as a grown woman. So Aaron, let me tell you, you have a special place in my heart and I can't wait for you to share your story. Next, we're going to have Sarah of Inspiring Life to Together. Inspiring Life Together is where Sarah and I met. Um, Inspiring Life Together is founder is Spring Williams. It's an organization in Marlton, New Jersey that provides uh, support, holistic support, mental, physical, emotional support to breast cancer surviving moms. And Sarah was my peer specialist. So Sarah was a person that called me once, you know, I was admitted into Inspiring Life Together as a mom and she supported me and it was so comforting to hear, you know, Sarah share her story with me and her being a mom and her being a survivor. And she would just encourage me and check on me. And it just meant so much to me. And then we have fun at the Inspiring Life events, events together. So next, I'm going to uh, introduce Angie. Angie is another Inspiring Life Together mom who I met. And you know, Angie and I would see each other at events. Actually, Angie, Sarah, and I all went with Inspiring Light Together founder Spring Williams and one other mom to see the movie Barbie. So we went to go see the movie Barbie. You know, Sarah and Angie have girls. I have sons. I kind of had to convince. Well, my oldest son didn't come, my youngest. 
But thank God Spring has a younger son. So our sons were able to connect. But, you know, my son, I was like, get in a picture with us, get a Barbie picture. Our sons were like, we're good. <laughs> so Angie and I, you know, Angie, I felt like we really connected when we were at Spring's house during a wellness retreat. So Spring, the founder, had a wellness retreat at her house and we're sitting around in a circle and we're sharing our stories. So everybody's sharing their breast cancer survivorship story. Angie and I are sitting next to each other. And this one mom was like, yeah, what had, you know, my husband discovered my lump. And Angie and I were like, yeah, shout out to the husbands discovering their wives lumps. Weren't we, Angie? Angie and I were over there cutting up. So I just feel like that was just like a pivotal moment in our relationship, you know, because we're not married. So we just want to give a shout out to all of the husbands discovering their wives' lumps. Anything wrong with that, girls? Come on. All right. So then I want to introduce Jess. Oh, my God. Jess Isimoto. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. Jess and Deb. Actually, we were on a panel together last week, last Thursday, talking about creating and maintaining healthy boundaries in partnership with For the Breast of Us and Count Me In. And I was just so impressed by how Jess and Deb shared their stories. And I feel like Jess and Deb, they are both such trailblazers in their communities. Jess is from the Asian community. She's going to share her story with us. She has been doing great work in this space. Deb from the Latino community and doing great work. So we're all breast cancer survivors. I'm so glad we're all here together. And listen, without further ado, let's jump into our story. So we'll start with Erin. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I was diagnosed also with DCIS when my son was three. Um, it was 2016, 2017. I was, I remember going, I was working out a lot and I would come home from the gym and I would jump in the shower. And when I would jump in the shower, I would have like a, like a little red mark on my skin and I would take note of it. Um, I would look at it in the mirror. It would catch my eye. I would jump in the shower. I would get back out. And by the time I got down, I feel like my body cooled off and it would be gone. Um, but there was a lump and I could feel it, but also I feel like my breasts had always been kind of lumpy. So it really wasn't completely out of the norm for me. And I always remember I would get lumps and my OB would tell me to kind of give it a month, see if it kind of dissipated and we would follow up. So that was the protocol I was finding or I was following. And I actually ended up going to a concert. My best friend lives in North Jersey. She got free concert tickets. And at a last minute effort, I asked my husband, can I leave my son? Can I go up there? Can I sleep over? And he was like, you have to, it's your best friend. So just a backstory on my best friend. She, her mother did pass of metastatic breast cancer. Um, she lived with it for about 25 years. So all through, I mean, middle school and high school and into our college years, that was something we were kind of going through together. Yeah. Um, so that's something I know that she is always on the lookout for as well. We went to a concert, uh, we had a great time. We went back to her house that night and I went to go to bed in her guest room and she came over and I was in bed and she was like above me and she was like, do you have a lump? And I was like, oh, I do. And I was like, how did you know? And she said, the whole concert, I stuck, I had my hand like this and she like noticed that I was standing like that. Oh. And so she asked if she could feel it. And I actually asked if she would, um, I felt that she would, be a very valuable resource. Right. She touched it and she immediately pulled her hand back and said, that's not good. <gasps> and I, I mean, it definitely took over me and I was like, I, this can't be bad. I, I don't have an option. This can't be bad. So I make an appointment because she persists that I do. I go to my OBGYN. I am 33. Um, she touches it. She tells me, not to get my son a stepmom. I'll be just fine. I'm too young. It's not cancer. Oh my goodness. And I was like, oh, okay. That felt good though. Like I was like, that is what I wanted to hear. So I, I, before I left, I explained that like my best friend's mom had just passed like a couple months previously. I would really like to put her mind at ease. Would you mind writing me a script for a mammogram and ultrasound? Like I actually just want to ease her anxiety. And the doctor was like, yeah, sure. There's no harm in that. So 
So she writes the script, but I had no sense of urgency. I did not, she did not make me feel that I needed to hurry and do this. Yeah. So I, I didn't schedule it right away. Um, uh, my best friend did get on me and she called me one day after asking me a couple of times and she was crying and she was like, can you please do this for me? Like, I need to know that this is nothing. So I was like, absolutely. I go on South Jersey radiology. I schedule the appointment. It's all set. Um, my mom comes to watch my son. We're in the process of buying a new home. Oh. And my husband and I were like, we'll make a date out of it. We'll go, we'll do this. We'll go out to lunch. We'll buy some new house furniture. Um, I go to the ultras, I go to the mammogram first and they tell me they see absolutely nothing, but to have a seat in the waiting room and there, there was a script for an ultrasound to follow. Yes. So I'm sitting there. I took my first ever selfie in my little hospital gown to show my best friend that I was fine, that I was doing it. And she was going to be able to check this off her list. Oh. Um, <clears throat> they have me come into the ultrasound room which I find to always be very eerie. And that's just my personal. Everything has ever bad breast cancer rise has always happened in that dark ultrasound room. Um, so they did the ultrasound, the woman left. And when she came back, she came back with a doctor and the doctor really didn't look at anything and just bluntly said, this is cancer. It's really bad and we move, need to move quickly. And I repeatedly said, no, I'm a mom. No, I'm a mom. I have a little boy. I have a little boy. Um, and I just, that's the only thing that actually kept coming out. I couldn't get anything else to come out. I think at one point they asked me if there was someone they could call. And I was like, my husband's in the waiting room. Um, so they brought him in and they told him and we left knowing that I had cancer, but like I hadn't even had a biopsy yet. Uh, yes. Yeah. So it was just, I think it's just, it's scary to know that like they can know something or if you can just view something visually and you can know that strongly. Um, I'll fast forward a little bit here just cause it's bumpy and I have multiple things, but I did get diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, initially it was DCIS, but it was very large. It was not fitting what they would say was the typical DCIS. So they kept questioning if it was invasive or not. Um, they, they thought it was much worse than what my biopsy kept telling them that it was. Okay. Uh, they prepared me for, I was going to have to do everything. Um, the size of my tumor and my frame is a little bit smaller. So they weren't sure how they were going to close me up after my mastectomy. They did it. I needed a mastectomy. It was not an option. Okay. Um, so I went into surgery being very unsure. Um, there was a couple options and I was fine with any of them, but one of them was they were going to skin graft my thigh and they were going to lay a piece of skin just over the top of my breast to close it. Um, I would not have a breast. I would not have reconstruction. That was fine. I would be here to raise my little boy. Yes. Um, I wake up in recovery from my surgery and my husband whispered to me that they got it all and that they were able to close me. And I remember asking if we could go to Disney. I'm not sure why <laughs> drugs, I guess. <laughs> um, but that felt incredible. That felt, we went from very, very, very scary to, oh my gosh, this is, I can do this. I can do this. And this is the start of me being able to handle this. Um, so I didn't have to do any treatment after that because they, although it was very large, it was considered DCIS. Yes. Yep. So I was able to do expanders and get reconstruction. Okay. As soon as I did the reconstruction, I started feeling extremely ill. I didn't know if it was the implants. I didn't know what it was, but I was, I was not okay. I deteriorated for like two years. Oh. I was really just struggling to function. I love working out. That was just not happening for me. I don't want to say that I was like gaining weight, but like physically I would kept notice my body was just larger. I couldn't keep my wedding ring on. Um, I just fell off. I just didn't feel well. I felt like I was 90 years old, mm -hmm. but yet I was doing all the right things. So it didn't really make sense. Um, long story short, I woke up one morning, like 2 AM and I wanted my implants out. I was done. I couldn't breathe. They felt heavy. They were cold. 
I didn't know if that was the issue, but I was done. Yeah. My husband completely supported it. And I remember being like, are you going to be okay with this? And his response was, I just want you. And I, that was it. I moved forward. I went to a plastic surgeon who told me I was too young and I needed to have breasts and he would not remove them. So I needed to find another surgeon and the surgeon I found was wonderful. I had to travel um, to see him. He removed everything. I ended up having MRSA around my implants, which makes sense because I did keep getting infections. And that is probably part of why I was not feeling well. Right. So I ended up having MRSA and they had to like burn all of this tissue off of my chest. And I remember getting images after and it just was like charred. So I am completely flat. I have no breasts. Um, I'm mostly fine with it. Um, I Athleta makes a whole line of mastectomy bras and inserts. So I have foam boobs and I put them in my bras. Um, So I was pumped to make it five years. I wanted to have a party. I was going to go so hard. Um, I was really excited for it. I remember like telling my husband things that I wanted and things I planned for. Um, And I was just shy of my five years by three months. And we were going to Portland, Maine. The next morning, my son plays travel ice hockey. So I see really cool parts of the world that I otherwise would not. Um, We were getting ready to leave. I had done a workout that morning. I was laying in bed. And of course, I I don't have breasts. So often if I do a workout, it feels funny. So I was kind of just like rubbing here because like I do have a little muscle. And I went over my sternum. And I just in my head remember saying a bad word. Um, And I knew that the cancer was back. It was in between my ribs and my sternum. There was like a hard nodule. I swear to you, it was not there the day before because I am obsessive, too obsessive with how much I touch, touch my chest. Yeah. Um, I decided I was going to go to Portland, Maine. I was going to enjoy this trip. It was four or five days. And on my ride home, I would contact my providers. I did. Um, they, had an, they had an original um, ultrasound for me many weeks out. And I remember hanging up the phone and being like, no, it's, I know it's bad. I can't wait that long. I called my nurse navigator. She got me in, I think the next day, like 11 AM. I went in, they did, uh, Dr. Roth, who you mentioned in the beginning of this, does my second ultrasound. And as soon as I saw the screen, I knew, and she told me that, this was cancer. So she immediately called for an order. They asked me if I was okay staying. She was like, I don't want you off this table. And I was like, I will stay. But I promised my son I would be at his hockey game. It was the last day of his like hockey camp. He made me promise I would be there. She was like, how much time do I have? And I was like, I need to be there at 1 p.m. It was like 11.25, something like that. I do the biopsy. It was so painful because I had no breast tissue. It was just bone. I'm just bone. Um, so the needle kept, you can't numb bone. So the needle kept hitting my, um, sternum and my rib and it was horrific, but I got through it. I do the biopsy. It will not stop bleeding. I am, I mean, I have no makeup left. I clearly have been crying. I need to show up to my son's game and I need to look like I have my life together. (laughs) Um, I text my husband from the bed. I was like, it's back. Um, the, where I now work is I was not working at the time, but they swooped in incredibly. Someone ran to CVS and bought me mascara. Um, someone while I was getting, someone went and got my clothes while I'm getting dressed. Someone is like holding pressure on me. I had a tank top and shorts on. Um, they're hiding, like, how can we hide this in your shirt? So your son doesn't see a bandage. Um, I leave with like eight minutes to get to the ice rink. I show up to the ice rink. My husband is standing at the end. We make eye contact. His eyes are watering. And I was like, nope. And I go all the way to the other end. Cause I can't even, we can't be near each other. Um, 
he was broken, I was broken, and we just needed to. So I went and I sat at the far end of the stands. My son always comes out and smiles when he sees me and shoots a puck at the glass. <laughs> and I smile and I act like I'm fine. They drop the puck. He goes, he scores a goal immediately within like 10 seconds. And I'm heartbroken. Yeah. Because I, can, I cannot leave this little boy. Yes. To not look in the stands and see me. But here we are doing it again. So I'm, I'm just heartbroken that this is part of his childhood twice. And that when we're doing play dates and stuff, sometimes you're coming with me to cancer appointments and mommy's making it fun. Um, but we do it again. Um, this time they were very concerned that it was stage four and they actually halted all of my surgeries to remove this because they thought it had spread to my femur and everywhere else. Um, they do a couple additional tests. They're about to do the bone biopsy and they realize it's actually a stress fracture. It is not the cancer metastasizing. Yeah. However, I had already gone through all those emotions, <laughs> which was the darkest place I've ever been. This was the second time I've done cancer was during COVID. So it was much lonelier. Um, no one's at your appointments. No one is with you. No one is, I mean, nobody, no one's driving me. I'm doing it all. And I, you think you're fine. And most of the time I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I got it. I got it. And I was, um, but that did really catch up to me after, like, you really aren't fine. Like I did it and I was fine at the time, but the, you know, going to the cancer center and having treatment, like those were my people. That was my safety net. And I actually found myself feeling really unsafe when I wasn't there. Somehow being with them was making me okay. And now like we were actively doing something to, to defeat the cancer. Um, but and then I really was struggling to get my feet back on the ground. Cancer once is one thing. Cancer a second time, much harder for me personally. Yeah. Um, so I went to a follow-up appointment. My doctor asked me what I needed. I'm crying. And I was like, I think I need to go back to work. Like, I can't be in the house anymore. Like, my thoughts are filling the home. This is not healthy for me. Mm -hmm. I need to do something. And she asked me if I would want to work there and be a part of their team. Oh my goodness. And I'm crying. So I was like, please don't use this as the interview. <laughs> this isn't my <laughs> best look. <laughs> Not my cutest look, but so long story short, they created a role um, at the cancer center that we're kind of growing and learning. So this is a brand new role and I've been in it just over a year. Wow. But ultimately, I felt one of the biggest needs was somebody with you during a biopsy. Because while the doctors are looking on the screen of your images and not speaking to you, and the lights are dim, and whoever you came is in the parking lot or in the waiting room, and there's a needle and a probe and all these terms, like that is absolutely terrifying. And you don't know what they're saying and what it means. And it's lonely um, to sit there and not really know what's coming next. And I think often as women, we're, we're holding a lot of our lives outside of there together. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a chance to break or feel really vulnerable or scared. And so I started this job. I wasn't sure if it would maybe affect me too much. Like maybe I wasn't like, am I too close? Yes. I have not once felt that I'm too close. I feel that every woman that I'm meeting is somehow healing me unintentionally. I don't always share my story with them. It's yeah. not about me. It is about you in this moment. And I just do my very best to be with them in that moment and know what that darkness feels like and know what that silence is when there's three doctors back there looking at your images and they're discussing something. I'm going to tell you what that means. I'm going to tell you what they're doing. And if you want to see the images of your breast after, I want to show you that. Um, that's your body. And you should know what that looks like and what's being done and why we're doing it. And so that is how I reconnected with you 15 years later. 
Oh my God. Like, wow. I'm like all choked up over here because, you know, that was so helpful for me when you did share your story with me. Cause yeah. you know, we all, when everybody, when any of us heard the word cancer, we yeah. felt something. And whether yeah. it's anxiety, for me, it was anxiety, like extreme yeah. anxiety. For some people, it's like depression, anxiety. Yeah. Some people, it's trauma. And for you to be in that room. So I think we have that in common. You know, yeah. when I, I don't know if you remember, but when I had my biopsy, after they did the biopsy, Aaron did such an awesome job, like walking me through everything they were doing. But I felt something warm drop on my lap. And everybody was like, oh, don't look down, don't look down. And I'm like, yeah. what's, what's going on here? I was bleeding out. Like they had to hold the pressure yeah. on me for like 15 minutes because I just kept bleeding. Yeah. And something in me, I was like, oh my God, I have breast cancer. Like uh, something with something with you being there like 15 years later and then me bleeding out. And sure enough, when they called me like a week later, they were like, yeah, you have breast cancer. But I got to tell you, Aaron, I love that you had that standpoint of letting it be the woman's moment. And yeah. you said you don't share your story with everyone. I know, you know, as therapists, as counselors, mm -hmm. we got to kind of play it by ear. But yeah. for me, when you shared you know, cause you know, we were catching up at the same time and you were telling right. her boy mom too. And that yep. just really helped encourage me when you, I'm looking at you standing here and you're like, I'm a two-time breast cancer survivor. It gave me so much hope. Yeah. I think you can usually read and I try very hard to read each person that comes in there and yes. certain ones, you know, exactly which direction it needs to go. And there's certain moments, you know, Someone wants to talk about their dog and I'm all for a good dog story. Um, and some people are dying for someone to tell them that they have been there and that they are okay. Yep. And you can usually feel that feeling. Yeah. And I've had a few and I've had some really great ones. I've had some really heartbreaking ones and I've had ones I will never forget because you can tell when you're supposed to share it. Um, I just try not to overshare it because that moment is not about me. That moment is theirs. And I want to be what I, they need for me in that moment. Oh my God. We thank you so much for your services as a patient navigator. And I'm so happy that they're incorporating this more across programs. So Aaron, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for having me. All right, we are going to move on to my peer specialist, Sarah from Inspiring Life Together. Hi, Sarah. Mute there. Hi. Hi. So, oh, where do I begin? <laughs> so, I am coming up on two years cancer free as of November 9th. This coming November 9th. Um, I consider my date to be when I had my double mastectomy done. <laughs> so, I am both the daughter and granddaughter of cancer survivors, breast cancer survivors. So, I've always known, we've always had some kind of history going on in the family. I was 19 when my mom was diagnosed and my mom was 45 at the time when she was di first diagnosed. She was also diagnosed with DCIS. She had a single mastectomy and I can remember like helping take care of her and everything after she had her mastectomy and going through things with her. Much like you guys, she was caught super early in a routine mammogram. So she didn't have to have chemo, radiation, you name it. Unfortunately, um, her cancer also returned 10 years later in the other breast that she didn't have removed at the time. So she had another mastectomy. Again, it was a thing they caught it super early in an, another mammogram. So life is good. She's now I think just about 15 years past that second bout. So she's doing well. <laughs> um, so it's always been in the back of my mind, like, okay, my mom was in her early forties. What do I need to do to be proactive and preventative um, for myself? So I started mammograms at age 30, had them yearly, was coming up on 40, had my usual mammogram. And my OB said to me, you know what? Um, they keep telling me in these mammograms that you have really dense tissue and with really dense tissue, it can be really difficult to see a good picture on a mammogram. So I'm going to go ahead and write a script for an ultrasound for you. Not a big deal. Uh, if you don't want to have it done or whatnot, but I, it's 
it might just give you a better picture. So I didn't think anything of it. May of 2021, I have the mammogram. Mammogram's clear. She writes this script. I didn't really pay much mind to it. I made the appointment and I went in July for the ultrasound. So in the ultrasound room, the ultrasound tech keeps going back over the same spot on my left side, back over it, back over it. Of course, much like Erin said, they, she left the room, came back with the doctor who also, you know, she goes back over that same spot again with him looking. And I'm like, okay, what are we looking at here? So he sat down and said, you know, I don't like the looks of this. There's two spots that I'm concerned with. And I really don't want you to take this lightly. I want you to go for further testing, whether it's an MRI, a biopsy. You need further imaging of these spots that I'm seeing because I don't like the shape of them. Like you tried to kind of explain it a little bit, which was good. So okay, deep breaths, like, you know, I'm 40, but this could be nothing, but you know, I'm proactive. I'll go set up the test, the whole nine. So I set up, I had the biopsy and lo and behold, a couple days or whatever it was like a week later, they call me on the phone and say, okay, it is indeed cancerous. Um, we think, you know, the size from what we can tell is relatively small. So we think we caught you pretty early, which is good. So let's move forward with you meeting with a breast specialist and, you know, getting your, getting yourself together. So that was <sighs> like my moment of, holy shit. <laughs> I, at the time I had a three-year-old getting ready to turn four daughter and I'm like, okay, so knowing that my mom has been through this, grandma has been through this and thinking to myself, okay, if this, this is cancer and this is what it is. I'm going in, I'm going to have a full blown double mastectomy. I'm not going to play around. I want them both gone. They've served their purpose. Yes. And that's that. But in the meantime, I'm, it's also in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, how am I going to explain all this to a three, almost four year old? Like, okay mom's got to get her chest completely taken off and and whatever the subsequent be because at this point in time you don't know in the beginning will I need chemo will I need radiation what will that that what's this course going to look like it's 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 daunting so um I can remember going with my husband to the breast surgeon and telling her what we've decided and um she had said early on, as well as my oncologist, when I met with them, that because they were looking at a relatively small size tumor, they felt that more than likely I wouldn't need chemo or radiation. Because um, they could tell in my breast MRI, they could see my lymph nodes and my lymph nodes looked fairly healthy. So they kind of were fingers crossed that nothing would spread to my lymph nodes. Okay. And then, yeah, no chemo, no radiation. So... Uh, that was early September. My mastectomy, of course, was the beginning of November. So that time is <laughs> preparing. You almost don't know what to prepare for, or how to prepare, and what do you need? What do you not need? Um, my mom was decent support, but I was also 19. We were grown when she had cancer as opposed to being the mother of a young child and figuring out like, okay, our family dynamic is going to change with the abilities and the things that I do day to day for her. So um, lo and behold, had the mastectomy, same day surgery now, even with a double mastectomy. Uh, I was done through Virtua, Virtua's team. Um, came home, <laughs> was doing fairly well. Um, I also came home with expanders, uh, with plans for reconstruction. Um, kind of, I had the blessing of having, um, a good friend of the family who stepped up and came every morning to get my daughter dressed and take her to daycare. Mm -hmm. Because there are things that I, I couldn't physically handle. 
So um, that was a big help. Um, and I had a few other people that would step in and kind of help where they could either bring in meals by or what have you. Cause my husband went back to work fairly soon. Um, he doesn't get paid days off. So somebody's got to keep working. <laughs> um, so three weeks out, I started feeling feverish and crappy and, um, my chest began to feel like hot the whole nine. Lo and behold, I go to the plastic surgeon's office to say like, hey, something's going on. I don't like the way I feel. I had become septic and had a MRSA infection as well. So they quickly readmitted me to the hospital <laughs> and I had surgery to clean out the whole nine. <laughs> that was right before Christmas. Oh, Sarah. It was a little rough that year. Um, and then I had about a month after that, I had some trouble with my skin. You're, when you take away all that tissue, that healthy tissue out of your skin, you take away like such a huge blood supply to your skin and your skin gets like paper. Oh. And I had some necrosis pop up oh. on my, that again, they had to surgically like kind of graft and mess with. So I wound up having in the course of six months, including the final surgery to put my implants in, I had something like five surgeries. <laughs> and I was back and forth to the hospital with these goofy infections because the reconstruction is, is no joke. <laughs> Aaron, uh, yeah, your story sounds so much like mine too. Yeah. With the reconstruction, it's, it's, Holy cow. That I wasn't prepared for, of course. And it put me, it put me, um, put my healing time out a lot longer than expected, which, um, was a little rough on us too. So, but, um, going forward. So I take uh, karate, a local karate school <laughs> going for black belt soon. I love it. I trained with a group of adults and I was just to the point, like late spring of 22, I was just starting to get back on the mat again, just starting to feel good training, training with a couple moms that I knew. And lo and behold, one says to me one night, yeah, I found a lump oh, no. and looked at it, felt it myself. I'm like, girlfriend, I'm giving you the names of everybody that I've seen in my journey. Yes. Go see them. Go see them ASAP. Lo and behold, she also wound up being diagnosed um, with breast cancer. Hers was a little bit different stage than mine, but she um, went along with my team. She had chemo and radiation because of her staging and mm -hmm. a double vasectomy. And um, in her course of things, she... Um, let me know about inspiring life together. Oh. So he had um, been accepted as one of our ladies and her and I were going back and forth, I think on Facebook, like publicly under like a picture of her, I think. And spring found me <laughs> and started to chat with me and asked about coming on board to um, be part of the team. So at that pretty Pretty far in my recovery, I felt good, felt comfortable um, meeting with people, talking with people, and that's kind of how I came to be with Inspiring Life Together. And um, I'm the peer supporter with them, so I have a couple of ladies throughout the month that I touch base with that I say, "Hey, like, what are your needs?" Because our our group um, provides goods and services for primarily moms. Um, that are undergoing treatment. So we say like, uh, what do you need in terms of, do you need help with groceries? Do you need help with um, anything with the kids? Um, this August, we put backpacks together with everybody's school supply okay. list from their schools um, for all of their, their kids to go back to school with school supplies. Um, we just had a event for our kids where we got a bunch of our kids together and, um, 
they got to meet a gentleman by the name of Josiah Pipple, who is from American Ninja Warrior. And he took the kids through um, like a series of obstacle courses and things like that. We did our Barbie movie night. Um, and we're also looking to not just take care of our ladies that are currently in treatment, but also taking a look at life beyond breast cancer, um, beyond the treatment and going forward and getting back into healthy lifestyles and continuing to live fulfilled, happy lives beyond the breast cancer. So we've had several uh, wellness events where we get together and do different things like a yoga retreat. We've done um, some other things. So um it's a great great organization yes oh sarah thank you so much for sharing your story we actually have the founder spring williams is actually on zoom and we don't know spring if you can get on camera and wave to us but if not we understand but spring williams the founder but you know what i find interesting between you and aaron's stories is that they're spring hi spring founder of inspiring light together you and aaron you know have- <laughs> it's I'm, like popcorn popping over here as my kids are sitting here watching the game but I'm like I had to come on and Aaron your story I'm like over here sobbing hearing everything that you went through and how to turn that around as challenged as all the time using your pain for a purpose so you know I remember how that felt to sit in there in that room and it is it's, it's gloomy in there and like the language is going on and you're trying to figure it out. I'm looking at the screens, like what is it that I'm seeing over here? So what you're doing is is good work. So thank you for that. Yeah. And I just want to highlight with spring and I mean spring, Aaron and Sarah's stories, like you know, this is not a free boot job. No. Right? <laughs> There's this myth. I've been seeing in a breast cancer survivor. Yeah community women saying this is not a free boob job like people think oh I, people think oh, i'm just gonna get a, a set of free boobs i'm gonna get the size that i want and listening to you aaron and sarah like share your stories and a process you guys went through and people really think this is like a free boob job it was the probably the worst part for me i continually kept getting sick um i had several infections also was hospitalized so i really connected with that piece of your story and i not many people have shared that with me. I feel like I'm always surrounded by people and it's successful and it works and they have great boobs and they're perky and they don't have to wear bras. And I didn't have the same experience. And so I'm, that was really helpful for me to hear you say that. I'm sorry you went through it, but it was helpful to hear. Yeah. Oh God. And it makes this panel so much more meaningful because then you can connect to yeah. other people's stories. I love it. And I love the fact that both of your stories, Aaron, like you came out with this patient navigator role at MD Anderson Cooper, which is amazing. Sarah, you yeah. came out of this as a peer support specialist doing great work for breast cancer surviving moms. It's just so awesome and amazing. Thank you ladies so much for sharing. So now we're going to move on to another inspiring life together mother if she's available Angie are you available if not we will move on to Jess and come back to Angie so I don't see Angie on camera so there she goes don't sleep on Angie hi everyone Thank you for your patience. Uh, I have two children in the shower right now. <laughs> Got a multitask. We're multitasking mamas. So I have you in my ear <laughs> and I was running back to my room. We'll see how theirs goes. But um, yeah, I, I have two young daughters. Um, so I'll jump right in. Uh, I was trying to trying to backtrack in my brain where my story was on this topic. And I realize I have sh- I have shifted it back so far that I don't remember all the details and it wasn't that long ago um and as other people's stories come forward it's it hits hard it hits um that realization of trauma and I don't think it's unresolved trauma because I'm very aware uh I I stepped into the 
lots of healing spaces since this diagnosis, but I think it just reveals how our body holds on to the trauma and how our body responds to the trauma. Uh, and we don't always know when that's going to hit. And that's when we, we take time to protect our energy and take time to fill our space with people that hold safe space for us. So I'm grateful to be in this circle of heaven. <laughs> because I don't know how many tears are going to come forward or how much this will make sense <laughs> because the story is always what, what our perception is in the moment, right? We we could have told this a hundred times and it comes out different. It doesn't mean we lied about it or we're manipulating it. It means in this moment, my body is expressing it this way. Yeah. So... When I was diagnosed, um, well, I'll, I'll, I found the lump too. I found the lump. I, um, at the time, was a, a personal trainer and had just stepped into a new facility um, in a new state. Wow. So I guess, yeah. Um, and I thought I was checking off all the boxes eating well, taking my supplements, getting that protein, working out, lifting weights. It wasn't just a bunch of cardio. I was lifting weights. I was nice. building my body. Um, and I found this lump and I knew, I knew um, because I knew my body. I knew it was not okay. I tried to talk it off. I'm like, ah, this is just a weird milk lump. <laughs> I got, so like old milk came back. So yeah. my my kids at the time were, um, it was 2020, it was December of 2020. Cause we love that year. It was a great year. <laughs> and um, I had recently moved out of state of February, 2020, as I moved from Virginia to Cape May, New Jersey, to try to last ditch save a marriage. Yeah. And um, the, the kids were newly four and five, they were four and five. Um, and I knew enough about child psychology. I'm like, well, this is a huge thing for my four-year-old to be going through. This is a lot of imprinting and that I'm bad words will fly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why? Why um did these scenarios happen in this order at this time frame? Because what I had become aware of is that so much of my childhood trauma that I didn't want to start cycling it for my kids. Yes. <laughs> so um we got through the summer of 2020 I was unemployed because I had been working at a gym but everything shut down but that was a blessing in disguise I did earn unemployment and uh stashed that away because I knew things weren't going well with the husband yeah. and it was uh just kind of in survival mode we were in a deep survival mode we we um the the, the the last ditch effort for counseling was so sad. It was um, 2020, everybody was last ditch something. And, um, you know, we meet this stranger on a computer screen while our kids are downstairs unattended with a TV and we're trying to heal a decade plus of trauma and wounding and betrayal. And ah, so um by the time fall rolled around, I gave an I gave an ultimatum. I'm like, I will stay here in Cape May and continue my role as raising the children, the primary care, getting, you know, stay at home mom, the military spouse. Yeah. And just give me space. Just go find your space that we can do this separately with close proximity to our children. And that wasn't in the cards it didn't roll out that way mm -hmm. so I made them out um because I found a private school that the girls could attend full time that was open through the pandemic uh and it, it moved me about an hour north of him 
And it got me into that gym mm-hmm. that because um, as soon as the gyms opened in Jersey, I took my resume and I said, here I am, here I am, here I am. <laughs> what do you need from me? I'm in a mask, they're in a mask. I don't know you from anywhere, but here I am. Yeah. And I was living with friends, um, college friends. So that was a nice reconnection. And uh, considering all the different states I had lived in and I grew up in Maine. So it was cool that you mentioned about Portland, Maine. Yeah, I grew up there. So I'm very familiar with ice hockey and never part of it, but you know, it's cold and wintry up there. So people do those silly things on ice. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we made it work for the fall and I was rolling in some clients training of making it work girls were in school we weren't in each other's space so there seemed to be like some calmness some peace well my trauma responses of uh why the marriage was in a state it was was cycling and there were outside relationships that were causing more stress and it was at the gym facility it was out of state there was just things now that I see it looking back I'm like oh (laughs) that was a pattern that was a problem okay I see that I see this and um so by December 2020 my body screamed at me and said girl we got to deal with this because you have a very broken heart and we're gonna direct you right towards this is my opinion this is my experience with it that breast cancer came to me to heal my heart Mm -hmm. and um the reason I say it that way is because it gave me a ticket to so many communities of people that I never would have identified with I never would have needed to to feel that support or have a, a a ticket into their group like inspiring life together and um at first, I was like, I don't need this. I don't need that. I want to be alone. I got this. We like going through the separation during a pandemic and moving out of state felt like torture enough. Why am I going to be going through all of this treatment? Um, but like Aaron said, it became my state haven. It became my place of I'm taken care of <laughs> by so many nurses right now, <laughs> by so many doctors. I didn't care I was alone as far as driving alone. Um, um, there, there was a hard part of like, I don't have a partner or a spouse. Um, there was a hard part where they said, well, it's best to stay married because of insurance. That, that dug deep. That really hit hard because I'm like, why? Why do I want to stay energetically connected to this person that has no desire to show up for me emotionally, that has no desire to say, hey, how are you doing? Right. <clears throat> hey, can I pick up the kids while you're at chemo? <clears throat> and this is why I know that the trauma is in the heartbreak more than what my body went through in the diagnosis. Um, I was very, very, very fortunate to have a uh, smooth processes through the double mastectomy and the the chemo I did not have to do radiation I um, I was stage one but triple positive and so they said it was aggressive we needed to deal with it um I did feel very alone on the biopsy table it was painful but I knew then um and they tried to like downplay it. <laughs> I'm like, y'all yeah, can't, I guess <laughs> I know what's going on. So Aaron, the work you're doing is magical. Like you, you have a special gift and healing touch because I, that was where I felt the loneliness. That's where I felt F-U-C-K. <laughs> I, I had nobody drive me there. I felt like I had to be in secret because I was making up stuff. I thought like, well, I just need to go through the motions and then so yeah, it was nothing, you know, people were like, don't make it more than it is. And there was a lot of shaming. There was a lot of guilting. And I get it. People don't know how to deal with their own stuff, their own emotions, their own trauma. So when somebody else's comes into the picture, they have to downplay it because it'll trigger them. Yes. So I see that now. And um, 
I, I knew I was aware of it then and I I, I quieted myself a lot. Uh, there was a lot of grieving alone. There was a lot of processing alone, but I, I had my frontline people. Um, they couldn't be with me in person because of COVID, but they were with me on my phone and there were people around the clock. Um, <laughs> one really close, good set of friends. Um, uh, they've been with me since my babies were toddlers and they um, like, we still, they, they still talk me and walk me through everything. But I remember one night I was feeling so disconnected and so lost. I'm like, I can't, I don't know how to keep waking up. I don't want to keep pushing forward. So he's like, let's just design a kitchen together. Um, <laughs> let's just talk about something so different, so off the wall, so random but build a connection and like google different patterns and and it, the sky is the limit and i feel like that practice was such a beautiful rewiring of your neural pathways to say you can create anything you want in your mind yeah. you can heal any part of your body when you allow space of love oh. to heal you and to let abundance take over that scarcity so I um got through like that the in-depth part of treatment uh or oh I was talking about the biopsy mom as soon as I got a call from the radiology uh to confirm it was cancer um Dr. Flannery from MD Anderson swooped right in and calls me up Okay, this is what we got. It's cancer. What else is going on? <laughs> what else is going on in your life that you're stressful, like you're dealing with? So she let me lay it all out. She's like, yep, all right. Here's my cell. Don't abuse it. I'll cut you off. But here's my cell. Reach out to me. Let me know. And we still check in on each other. So I, I an angel, um, and I, I was discouraged to even find a care provider because originally the people referred to me weren't in my network. And that's when I was just at the beginning stages of learning how the network works. I didn't ever have, other than having two babies, I didn't have to deal with health insurance. I didn't have to deal with doctor appointments. I didn't even know anybody that had breast cancer ever. Wow. Wow. This was not in my family history. This was not in my friend's history. This is and I've been in multiple states. I've lived in multiple places. I I went to college. I I have. I've not been un, in a rock un, under a rock. <laughs> I um. So that's why I say it gave me a whole new world of amazing people. Yeah. Uh, so I always look at this diagnosis as um what it has done for me, not against me. Yes. Um. I got through the double mastectomy. I got through the chemo. Um, I was scheduled. They had me on a really nice treatment plan, but COVID uh, came in November, 2021. The family I was living with, me and my girls, we all got it. <laughs> it was a big old swipe through in November, 2021. And that wiped clean my reconstruction date. I felt really defeated then because um, my ex started to flip. Uh, the I think the aside from him not emotionally showing up and not um, being a supportive partner in that form, it felt like, well, I'm keeping married to you so you can have this health insurance. Isn't that good enough? It was a very condescending kind of treatment. And then he was dating and dating and dating. And it just felt like such a slap in the face. And then someone broke up with him and he's like, what if we get back together? I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> what? And it, it threw me though. It threw me into this cycle of 17 year old Angie popped back out and fell in love with them all over again. I'm like, yeah, like, of course we're gonna, you know, and started looking at apartments and, and, and then he wanted to get a house and I'm like, what are you doing? And I started to see the red flags and I started to speak up. And then he flipped a switch and got really, really mean and angry and um, threatening, taking everything from me. And then 
met somebody else and now is end up marrying her. And so all while I'm trying to like put my pieces back together and I'm not to not blame like we both had a side of the breakdown of our marriage, but I desired to work at it like actual therapy way at the beginning stages and he never believed. Yeah. So as I saw the like the breakdown getting worse and worse and treatment getting worse, I'm like this this was a, a sign of why I had to cut off, why I had to step away, why I had to heal in my own space because I couldn't heal in that environment and I couldn't reach the people in that environment. And I needed to show my girls a different way of thinking, a different way of life, a different way of loving. Um, and it does feel very lonely um, because as I see someone that I loved and devoted my life to move in with another person while I'm living in low income, while I'm you know, trying to work three, four jobs and raise the girls the majority of the time because he's not available for his parenting time. And now it's put on this other woman that went on the same page. We didn't become friends, you know? I didn't invite her to my motherhood. Yeah. Um, and I I have felt there the my worth being very challenged and I've done a lot of work around rebuilding worth and rebuilding um peace of mind in my own self, like knowing that nobody else's opinion matters. It's what Angie matters to Angie and trust with myself. I write a lot of love letters to myself. I need to pick that back up, but a lot of love letters. I write love notes on my mirrors. I walk by, I'm like, oh, hey, girl, <laughs> there's a dating myself, there's walking in the woods, there's all that heart rebuilding. And that's where I feel is the work of my cancer recovery. And to the women out there, um, in my particular situation, I'm not the only one that went through cancer and divorce at the same time. Um, I just have a different um uh, it is my own personal part to connect with somebody else. So I am so grateful for this space and I did get my reconstruction. Okay. It was an extensive 10 plus hour surgery and I was in the hospital for five days, but it went, I, my um, plastic surgeons practiced in Maine. He practiced in Maine when I was growing up there. And I was like, bingo, you're the one. <laughs> wow. And uh, Dr. Bonowitz. So huge shout out to him. Um, awesome. And you're, you're amazing. Went well, Angie, because we just heard the challenges with Aaron and Sarah's. But would you say your surgery went well? Yes. Yeah. And I've always felt guilt. I'm like, I don't want to talk about mine because it went really, it did. It went really well. Um, I, I have, you know, there's deformities or there's like, one side loses a little bit of shape than the other. Um, but I'm big into working out and lifting. I did, I got back into personal training. So shout out to Breezeway Coaching, um, where I, my training partner and giving me that opportunity to see, he saw my journey. He saw how I came back and he said, let's, let's promote this more. Like, let's bring this to the world more. Yeah. And I, so as far as my body, I look more, um, manly <laughs> and, and I have that more masculine appearance, which I'm very proud of because for everything that we have gone through in this part of our body to be able to do certain exercises, to even just lift our hands up over our head, yes. to do the push-ups, to do pull-ups. I'm not back at every part of my abilities that I was before, but I know how to. And I know that as I get through these other basic needs, like raising a, a single mom and, and getting um, income stability and all these other parts of my life in place, um, I know that once I have that support, it will bounce right back. And this is where I'm just so grateful for my body and, and the support that I had to keep that foundation through this. Cause that's where that, my fear was. I didn't fear the cancer spreading or death or um, the trauma that cancer can bring. I feared the loss of my body and the ability to play with my kids. 
the ability to function in my career, the ability to still play at heart uh, because I've been an athlete all my life. And that was really important to me. Um, but it also really helped me with body dysphoria, it really helped me with depletion or an overtraining and really reset my understanding of wholeness and wellness and and grounding and spiritual practices. It all has to synchronize. It all has a purpose and a place in our body. And so for me, movement is medicine because when I feel the emotions, that means I got to shake them out. I got to dance them out. I got to push them out. I've got to like get that out of my body so it doesn't find a a hiding place. Yes. Uh, So yeah, I, the reconstruction went really well. And then I even had a revision. Um, but since then divorce finalized, res- um, insurance changed. And now I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> because it's so, it feels so scary on this side of it, of, uh, co-pays and premiums and will my doctors be covered? And what if they find something, uh, I just won't go. So I'm, I'm in a, a stage of like, I need to get back into my routine of care. Right. and follow up um but uh i i am very very grateful everything was successful um all through it through the trenches it was it was like a war oh my god angie thank you so much for sharing your story you have been through so much and let me tell you emotional abuse is real in relationships. And we're not talking about it enough, but I'm going to be talking about it because I'm developing a course. It's called uh, How to Break Free from Emotionally Abusive Relationships. And there's so many people in emotionally abusive marriages, emotional abuse between parents and children, families, friends. So we're going to really be taking a deep dive into that. You know, stress plays a critical role in breast cancer and emotional abusive, emotionally abusive relationships play a critical role. So thank you so much for sharing, because I know there are so many women out there identifying with your story. You know, I was also divorced, but I actually got divorced before breast cancer actually officially showed up in my body, but you know, the majority of our stress comes from relationships. So that's why it's very important. Um, Jess, Deb, and I were all on a panel discussion last Thursday talking about what? Creating and maintaining healthy boundaries. So with that, we are going to hear Jess and Deb's story. Angie, thank you so much for sharing. And thank Jess, you. Thank you very much. You are so welcome, Jess. You know, as a trailblazer in the Asian community, Deb is a trailblazer in the Latino community, and we're looking forward to hearing your stories and your advocacy. Jess. Just a question about time. I see we're at the hour mark. I, I don't know how long you'd like us to speak. Yes. Yeah, so if you guys, so we're, we're slated to go to about 830 and, you know, including any Q and A's, but I don't think we'll have any Q and A's. A couple people in the chat thanked us for sharing their stories and that they had to go. So I think if you and Deb each kind of take maybe, you know, seven to 10 minutes to share. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, really, uh, really moved by the three stories that have been shared so far. So thank you all of you. Um, Wanted to add a little something to what Erin was saying as a patient navigator. I hope that's the right way to describe your your job. Um, One of the most painful biopsies that I had, I had a few, just killing me, but it was for a clinical trial. So there were extra people in the room because they were the people performing the procedure and then people from representing the experiment who had to be there to observe and then collect. And it was just really painful for who knows what reason. Um, But one of them was a nurse who wasn't allowed to participate because she was representing the trial. And she just reached out and squeezed the top of my foot. And I was full on wearing shoes. Like I was, you know, dressed from the bottom down, but just had the the gown on the top half of my body. So I was still wearing shoes, you know, just like laying there doing a biopsy. And she just kind of squeezed my toe. And it was that little moment, because I can't see, of course, but I could feel that person. So how important these things are during these traumatic periods where you are 
limited and freaking out and in pain. And it just, I appreciate that your job exists and that you're there doing it. Um, it I also wanted to give a shout out to something that Angie was sharing about how cancer can be your body telling you you need something. Um, in like a writing workshop I took, I've been doing a lot of writing about my cancer experience. It, it was like, um, what, what is cancer giving you that you might want to say to cancer? A dear cancer letter, if you will. Um, and I, I just broke down crying because mine was a thank you for letting me stop and reset my life um, at a time when I was probably, as Dr. Chalice shared, stressful at life and work. I was traveling internationally for business. I was working crazy hours, not constantly, but often 12 to 16 hour days. I was really stressed out, had a lot going on. And cancer gave me the excuse to stop, to take care of myself, to learn to sit, be patient, and not be in control and let things happen to me for me because of me and just sort of make different choices, just a reset. And it's something that it's hard to say because I don't wanna thank cancer for anything, um, but it's true. So yeah, um, I'd also share that. And I, this is not at all directed at anyone here, definitely not negatively, but for anyone who might be listening or watching this later, um, I don't have children, I'm not a mother. Okay. And I have, I guess the best way to say it is I also deserve to live just as much. Yeah. And I also desire to live just as strongly, yeah. even though I'm not taking care of children. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to put that out there into the universe. Yeah. I think that's something that's important too, for those of us who don't, and maybe now I biologically cannot have children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but still traumatic in my life. <laughs> still worried about the people I care for and, and I'm cared by. So, um, yeah. And then also, I would say that I found my cancer myself, like a lot of us, but I didn't know it was cancer because sometimes it's not a lump. Sometimes it's something else, you know? And I think that's so important to talk about. Um, I work with a group called Know Your Lemons, it's another one of the breast self-exam educational groups that I, I just love, and there's many out there. Um, and they have this great infographic of 12 different lemons <laughs> sitting in like an egg carton. And each one is a different um, example of a physical issue that could potentially be breast cancer. Just to remind us that it's not just the lump. Um, in my case, half of my breast had hardened completely. So I didn't really notice it because I wasn't good about taking care of my body back to the previous conversation about stress and ignoring my life and you know not not really taking care of myself and I just didn't notice and so when an entire half of your breast is hardened and the doctors I think you're too young and it's just it's an unusual symptom it's this fibroids it's just your body changes it's hardening it could be anything okay but it wasn't anything um, I still ignored it for a year because I'm crazy and I'm young and that's what people do and by young I mean I was like 41. <laughs> But really, you just sort of think of yourself at whatever age you are, you know, like I was just young and living my life and there's no way it's something bad. So this doctor didn't seem concerned. I'm going to ignore it for a year, a year, you guys, like a year. And finally, I realized I was having a lot of pain in my underarm, like I, as if I'd been carrying something like a purse, like, a, like if I stuck my wallet under my underarm, but I wasn't, it was just sore. And a good friend heard this complaint and was like, oh you need to check that out. And that really worked for me. And it was the power of friendship. Someone who said, I will no longer call you, text you, or talk to you until you get that checkup done, until you make an appointment. So I needed that, you know, I needed that sort of tough love to kick me out of it and, and go. And, and then it was instantly cancer. It was, they knew that the moment I took the mammogram, they actually asked me to stay for an ultrasound guided biopsy. It was, we knew right away, it was gonna be maximum stage three. It was everything. Um, so I literally knew that same day, which is kind of crazy, but that happens sometimes. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I had a really, really, really large tumor. It was invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, I had 10 lymph nodes with cancer. Wow. Yeah, my, the, it was an eight centimeter, eight to 10 centimeter tumor, so it's quite large. Um, yeah, I did all the things, chemo, which didn't work, radiation, mastectomy, reconstruction, ophorectomy, had an infection with my implants, had to have them removed, emergency surgery, all the things. Um, I'm doing great. I'm three years out now. I'm NED. And because I know, because I was involved in um, an experiment, I use an experimental drug, which is no longer experimental. It's now called Fresenio, and everyone knows it and has heard of it. But I was on it before it was released to the public, right? Which was lucky that I sort of got into this thing, this trial with my doctor. So I took it for two years and I'm done. So I'm actually in remission, even at the three year mark, which is crazy. I know it's really exciting. It's been through a lot. So I'm really happy, but the, the experience was tough. It was a lot of ups and downs. It was um, mastectomy and then clear margins. You're cancer free. Then the next month had a scan in preparation for radiation. We found more cancer. So it was just up and down nonstop. And I think a lot of us here share that story and, and too many of us have that story. But I would say it's kind of frustrating when you become a breast cancer patient because we're one of the most popular cancers. So you hear stories all the time. And it's a lot of these sort of very easy success stories because those are the snippets, the inspirational, the easy ones that look good, sound good and make us feel good in, right in media. So those are the ones that I heard too. So I was really confused and dismayed to find out that my journey was three years of being immunocompromised up and down with, you know, six surgeries. It's not this sort of like, oh, I did this one thing and I, three months was tough and here I am, you know, and I think that's, I, I wish that there were more realistic stories portrayed in the media, whether yeah. it's the news and people being interviewed, whether it's movies, whatever. Yeah. I think that it's not very realistic out there. Um, so hearing these stories now, been yeah. really helpful and validating and I would like to hear more of those in the public somehow you know yeah so, yeah I'm not sure what else there was to share but I think that kind of covers a lot of stuff yeah Jess we so appreciate you sharing and listen I love that you spoke up and said hey I'm not a mom because we tend to do that as women right we tend I know mm -hmm. I tend do we like thinking everyone's a mom but you brought up something so important I mean actually there are many breast cancer surviving women who wanted to be moms and didn't have the opportunity because maybe they didn't have children yet and the chemo sent them you know into menopause and they couldn't yeah. have children or people who had maybe one child and they were planning to have more children but they couldn't so Jess oh Sarah Aaron so look at this, Sarah, Aaron is one of them. And Jess, I don't know if you had dreams of being a mom and if, you know, those dreams were taken from you, but I just thank you so much for just highlighting that and sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think it's helpful for other people too, who are listening. It really is. It really is because, you know, you're an example of, you can still you know, find a way we can still find a way to like live our best lives now if we didn't have certain dreams fulfilled, you know, whether it was divorce or not being able to have children or, or something else, you know? Yeah. So thank if, if you don't mind me, Deb, taking another second, I'm sorry. I know it's your yeah. time. Go ahead. It's also part of that imposter syndrome and the guilt that we feel that like, and, and this is going to be hard to say because with metastatic breast cancer, with friends, I, I don't have that, but with friends who I'm losing to MBC, there's this feeling of why them, why not me, right? And I think we all feel this in regular life as well, but definitely in the cancer world. Yeah. And, and this also has to do with children. There's something about like, when I look at some of my friends who I know and love very closely, I kind of want to take on their pain and their issues because they're mothers and I want to protect them and their babies. But the truth is, and that's a wonderful feeling to have, right? To support your friends that way. But the truth is I matter just as much. And I want other patients to hear that I also deserve just as much to fight and live through this 
even though I don't have children to take care of, you know? So that's kind of why I was saying it. It has to do with that whole imposter and guilt thing. And I think it's helpful that we all keep kind of bringing that up and talking about it because every day there's a new one of us diagnosed is going to go through the same cycle. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> that imposter syndrome, because that's something that I think I kind of went through myself too, because it was like, okay, I got caught early. I chose to have the double mastectomy. There was no spread to my lymph nodes. So I felt um, that guilt of, okay, I don't have to do the chemo and radiation part that everyone else has to. So like, it's such a weird feeling. It really is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing. And last, but certainly not least, Deb Antivettles. Uh, I just thank you for having me on here. I'm, I'm like, I got really emotional listening to all the stories and I'm like rooting for Jess over here, like my fellow batty ambassador. I'm like, yeah, tell it how it is. I, you know, um, I was, I got really emotional with Angie's story because there's a lot of things that I could relate to. Um, but uh, let me try to tell mine real quick. So five years ago, I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. So I've been living with MBC for five years. Um, at the time of diagnosis, I was a disabled, I am a, am a disabled um, person. Um, I live with bipolar disorder also, and I was a single mom. Um, but the story really started two years before diagnosis when I was misdiagnosed. Um, at 35 years old, I went in, and at that time, I was still breastfeeding my two-year-old. I was a long-term breastfeeder. And I went in, and, I, and just to kind of give you a picture, low-income mom, no transportation, I came on the train. I was baby wearing my child, rushing into the appointment, and was a regular pap smear. And I and I had noticed I had puckering and like um, an inverted nipple. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna bring this up during this appointment because here I am, you know, with my two year old because I'm a single mom at the time, and I'm also in survival mode. So I'm a domestic violence survi survivor. I have a very emotionally abusive. Um, I'm not even gonna use the word co-parent because he doesn't co-parent biological father of my child. Mm -hmm. So I have all the stressors, you know, how living check to check, you know, trying to get to these appointments, trying to deal with the toddler at the time. This is the last thing really on my radar, like trying to deal with a lump in my breast. Uh, the provider that was on call that day was not my normal doctor. It was just some doctor and they were very dismissive. They were like, you don't have a history. Um, you're too young. Uh, it's probably just a clogged milk duct. And it really made me feel small. I felt like I was, you know, like, you know, I, like I was the ridiculous one. And it made me wonder, like, am I being treated this way because I'm on the state insurance? Am yes. I being treated this way because I'm a young Latina mom? Am I being treated this way because I look, I know how I looked. Like moms, we have a look <laughs> with toddlers and stuff and kids. And, and so I, I let it go. I believed what he had to say. And I ignored the lump for two years. So Jess, you said one year, two years went by. I now have a four-year-old. I'm feeling better. I've been in therapy for a long time. I'm getting back into the dating scene. Um, I'm a community activist. So I was an organizer with a group called Utah Against Police Brutality. And in 2016, there was a lot of um, victims of pol police violence in our area. So I was busy organizing rallies. We were doing protests. And then we were protesting kids in cages, you know, at the border. So there was... I was committed to my community and of course to my child first and fighting an abuser in court for custody. So I had a lot of things going on, but I went on a date and it was a very good day. And the date, the date is the one who found the lump. Oh, where's, and, where's Angie at? Know. Angie, we have another person who's, I mean, her date found the lump. <laughs> so they found the lump. The guy totally freaked out, you know, and it wasn't anything serious. We'd only been dating for a couple of weeks and he insisted that I go. And I would later find out that he insisted that he had lost someone to NBC close to him. And so he chose to not continue the relationship when I was diagnosed. And that was fine because it opened the door for the person I was meant to be with. Um, but I go, I was like, fine, I'm going to go in and get this lung checked out. And I was no longer breastfeeding. So I knew that it was probably something serious. And so I went in on a Monday the very next day, they wanted me to come in for um, for the mammogram. They asked me to stay, just like you, Jess. They asked me to stay to do the, the biopsy. The biopsy was so painful, and I was also alone. 
because my best friend had come with me, but my child was getting out of preschool and I was just so concerned for someone to be there for her, you know, that I was like, just go, go. And so I ended up being alone, but there was a nurse that held my hand and like that meant so much to me and stuff. But I, I'm scared because I have biopsies coming up this week. So I'm like, I don't want to relive this all over again. But anyways, two days go by after that and they confirm it. We're so sorry. It's, you know, a triple positive. You know, I don't even know how they like knew all this stuff so fast already, but I really, my reaction was probably very different from other people. I was like, I, I treated it like something else on my list that I had to deal with. But I was like, I, I'm i already busy. I, I have to deal with a, uh, an abuser. I have to deal with, you know, taking care of my child. I have to deal with my community because I love my community and I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing here and stuff. So I'm just going to just go through this, get through it, do whatever I have to do. And at the same time, I'm in a bipolar episode. So I'm like, I have to be smart, right? I have to like this cancer diagnosis has now triggered bipolar symptoms. So I know I better bring somebody with me because there's no way that I can make decisions when I'm not in a stable state of mind. And I wanted to go to the natural route. So I was like, okay, I met with the oncologist, you know, and, and she was like, we need to run some additional tests. And I was like, whatever, you know, and I was very matter of fact because everything else was more important and not me, not my health. Everything else was more important. And unfortunately, we did two more weeks of tests, and that's when they told me, actually, it's metastatic. It's already in your sternum. It's in between your lung cavity. It's in your mediastinum. And so then I got scared. That's when I got scared. Because when I was first diagnosed, I was like, no, I had, I had believed all the stories, you know, early, you know, early, catch it early, you're going to beat it. But now I was like, oh, I'm not going to beat this. This is like mm-hmm. stage four. And I freaked mm-hmm. out. And I was like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to just try it my way for a little while. And I put off doing chemo. They said I was already beyond surgery, so I couldn't have surgery because it had already spread everywhere. And so I was like, fine, just give me a couple of weeks. I wanted to just have some, like, make some memories with my child before I start chemo and this whole journey and stuff. And I wanted to, you know, we had some big rallies and stuff coming up. So I wanted to be okay to be there for my community and stuff. And then um, I started chemo. I did four months of Taxol, Herceptin, Progetta lost all my hair. My hair was down to my waist. And as a Latina, I was like really culturally connected to my hair. I had a beautiful long mane of hair and stuff. So that was really hard to lose. I don't care when people say it's just hair. Yeah, It was hard. And but something beautiful happened in this, right? All these people from these uh, uh, activist groups that I belong to and stuff came together. They gathered money for me. They made a meal oh. train for me. They came and helped me with my child. I had no family in this state. So my sister-in-law quit her job in New Mexico and came to stay with me for two months to help me with my four-year-old. And so it was like, it was something just so incredible because I wasn't used to it. I was an independent single mom. I always did everything on my own, very little help, you know? So I was not, it was all, it was so much love that it was like overwhelming for me. I was like, I don't, you know, I had to realize like I'm deserving of this, but I didn't have that. Like, that's that was the process that was what happened with me with getting sick was like like the universe was like it's time for you to focus on yourself and to let love in so i like to say that with my cancer diagnosis i had to learn to let love in and let people love me and help me and stuff and so now you know here we are you know time is going by i haven't reached out for any support in the breast cancer community it took me about a couple of years you know i started feeling a lot of pain and stuff and i was like maybe, maybe I should meet some other people (laughs) going through metastatic breast cancer because it was starting to feel kind of isolating. And I just wanted to know if what I was feeling was normal. So I started slowly. I joined a few groups online. Then I attended a few, like the Living Beyond Breast Cancer Metastatic Conference when it was still online. I attended that. Then I was like, you know what? Like, I can't do the activism that I used to be able to do anymore. I can't be out in the streets protesting, but I have all this energy inside of me that needs to serve a community I'm going to go into breast cancer advocacy. I'm going to, I'm going to redirect and I'm going to take all these efforts and this experience and I'm going to put it somewhere else. And so I um, was accepted into the LBBC young advocate program. I was trained to them. I did that for a whole year. I found for the breast of us, like with Jess and I became a body ambassador. And I said, this is where I'm going now with this. You know, I'm still protesting police violence, of course, and all these things happening, but I can do this from home where I'm sick a lot of days and I'm fatigued a lot of days, but I can still sit at my desk like I'm doing right now and do the work and continue doing the work. And in the meanwhile, 
I'm still going to therapy. Good. I'm still having a, men a mental illness while I'm doing this. I'm scared because my latest scans showed some susp suspicious spots. So I'm waiting. I was like kind of looking at my phone while you guys were telling your stories because I keep waiting for the hospital to call to schedule these next PET scans and biopsies and stuff. And so I'm sort of in limbo right now with my treatment. Like I have been doing so good and now there's this new thing. And so now I'm having to navigate the feelings all over again and keep myself here because I don't want to trigger a big episode again. I'm already feeling a certain way. And so it's like, I'm keeping myself busy by doing these things, by sharing my story, by advocating, by sharing information, talking about it. And that's what gets me through is having a purpose, yeah. you know, redirecting my efforts and just putting it back into the, into this community now. And what a community it is. The breast cancer community is just like, it was just, it was like, whoa, like, and I, why did I wait so long to meet people, you know, and, and why did I wait so long to find support? And so now, you know, whenever I'm meeting someone just newly diagnosed, especially with metastatic breast cancer, um, I want to be able to, you know, to talk to them and help them through this and be like, you know, it, it, it is unpredictable. I'm scared. You know, I haven't, she's nine now. So my daughter's nine now. My story has gotten better. I met my husband a week after I started treatment. What? Um, so, so he did know that I had stage four breast cancer and he still wanted to pursue a relationship with me and we got married during the pandemic. So I have a, I have a whole love story that came out of this too. And then the abuser, well, I got to stand up in court last year and testify against my abuser and he was um, sentenced to jail time and I have a protective order in place and stuff. And so it's, it's like, it's been a lot of things happening while managing metastatic breast cancer while living with bipolar disorder and it's like i can't i can't stop because i'm not going to have that child be raised by a monster no way you know so i have to just do whatever it takes to stay alive and keep staying alive and and, and not focus on like what's going to happen but i do you know there's there's those moments and stuff where i i start to worry about the future what if you know and i and that's where i'm at right now where i'm in this like i'm trying to like shut it down where i'm like nope i'm gonna handle this just like i did the first time whatever this new oncologist says I need to do, I'm going to just keep doing it. I'm going to keep going to treatment like I've been yeah. going. We're going to see what's going to happen, you know. And that's just kind of where I'm at, where I'm just surviving day to day, taking it, you know, using my skills, managing my moods, taking my meds. You know, I've already been taking meds for a long time, so it was kind of just incorporating new things and just, and that's what we do, right? We adapt. Our lives change and we adapt. And and I think that I want to share to, to get yeah. it going. Oh my goodness, Deb, your story, all of our stories are so amazing, but you, I mean, you were inspirational in so many ways. I know you were like quickly sharing your story, but you were dropping such powerful nuggets that so many, like a range of women can identify with. So look at how through this conversation, we pulled out a theme of emotionally abusive relationships. This month is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Domestic violence is more than just physical violence. Domestic violence is physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, financial. Yep. It's all of these various things. And you're sharing how you're an overcomer. Angie shared, you know, going through a divorce and, and breast cancer, you know, at the same time. I was divorced before you know, a couple of years before I was diagnosed, maybe four years or three years before I was, you know, and then you're sharing, you know, because then there's relationship dating and relationships and how you were with the one guy and you thought, oh, maybe that might work out. But he left. But he left. Bye bye, sir. Because guess what? You're no longer blocking my future husband. We let the I feel like it all happened for a reason. Like the way I, I really do believe that it all unfolded the way it does. And I'm, and I am like thankful for that person. Like at first I was angry, of course, but I expressed my anger in a social media post. And this guy that was a Facebook friend, we had about a hundred mutual friends. He's also an activist in the community reached out and said, Hey, I had a brain tumor, you know, and I know what it's like for people to leave and to just, you know, say they're going to be there. And then I was like, I kind of knew who he was because he was a Facebook friend and, and I decided to reach out to him. And, you know, six months later, he's telling me, I love you, you know, and now two years later, here we are and stuff. And so I feel like that's how it worked. I got to still have my love story. I got to still have this, you know, something so special in my life came out of this. And it's because of him that I was able to have the strength to face the abuser. And, you know, he helped me push forward and be like, no, you're going to go 
you know, I know you don't like the police, but you got to go get help from the police. You got to go get a protective order. You got to go do this. And so I feel like everything happened for a reason. I'm not saying it's a good thing that I have metastatic breast cancer, but I'm trying to find the things that have come out of it and stuff, you know, and I feel so, you know, I feel supported. So I, I feel like, you know, this time around it's different. You know, now I have a breast cancer community. Now I can share what I'm going through in real time you know, and have people saying things to me and stuff and, and, and I'm taking it in and I'm like, I am worthy of this. Mm -hmm. I am worthy of support. I am worthy of love, you know, and I want to keep paying it forward, you know, especially because I come from a community where it's so hard to, to be open and to talk about, you know, difficult things and stuff. I'm like, I'm going to be yes. the one. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to put it all out there. And, you know, because I, you know, was looking for someone that, you know, is going through the same things I'm going through and I wasn't finding it. But now that I've been sharing this, I've had people reach out to me. Hey, I also have bipolar yes. disorder. No one told me steroids would bring out the symptoms. And I'm like, we, you know, we need to share this information. We need to like get it out there. We need to destigmatize talking about mental health issues and mental illness and stuff and just normalize it because everybody goes yes. through mental health issues. And then there are the people that are living with serious mental illness. They're so isolated and they're so scary. And I know I'm not the only one living with breast cancer and a serious yeah. mental illness, you know, and I just want someone out there that whoever's listening, you know, that might need to hear it. You're not alone. Like you're not alone. You don't have to go through it alone. Yes. Oh my God. I love all of you fellow pink sisters. We are all powerful in our own right. We have all found a way to turn our pain into purpose. You know, even going through our own struggle and journey and scanxiety, like you were just describing Deb and you know, various levels of distress and like how I described the extreme anxiety that hit me when I first found out, you know, but finding a way to reach back out and help others and us finding this sense of community in a breast cancer survivorship community, I think is so awesome. I just thank everyone because I know we all work so hard today and we got on here late at night. We got to all get up tomorrow and do it again. But we took the time to share our stories. I know this is going to bless so many people. And you know what? I love you, Pink Sister Survivors. And thank you guys so much for sharing. I wish everybody a great night's sleep tonight. Bye. So good. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you.